Well, before I forget, I, 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 of course, children could be dismissed, but I want to commend the uh, the worship team today, the the musicians and singers. They not having had a chance to run over things before we started, I think they did a great job. Because I know that a lot of times, even when we do practice, I sound like I ran over some things. So, all right, see how everything's working this morning. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And we need to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. We need to be like newborn babies and long for the pure milk of the word so that by it we may grow in respect to salvation. We need to prove ourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And finally, the, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Of course, we're still in Second Peter. Uh, we're looking at Peter who wrote this letter to um, encourage Jewish believers of the, of the diaspora, of the dispersion, to hold, uh, uh, be, diligent, be diligent to hold fast to God's precious and magnificent promises through which he says they would grow uh, uh, by the grace and knowledge of our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, and he, in these first several uh, verses, Peter, um, w- what we find today is that Peter is reminding them of something they already knew. But what exactly he was reminding them of is that God had given to them and by extension God has given to all of us who are believers in him everything that we need he says pertaining to living godly lives everything it just uh, if you were here for Sunday school this morning it, it was it's almost like an echo of what he was speaking of this morning that God has given us everything we need for godly living and that godly living comes through the true knowledge, he says, of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So in other words, godly living is provided for us or, or we are directed to the word of God in order to find how to live godly lives. He's given us Peter says that uh, his precious and magnificent promises and he says by those Precious and magnificent promises, we become partakers of the divine nature. In other words, that divine nature uh, of the new man in us being generated by the Holy Spirit when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Peter says that that, uh, those precious, magnificent promises enable us to begin to live out the divine nature of that new man who's been created in us. And then he lays out or gives us a snapshot, if you will, of Christian virtues or of Christian maturity. And he says, this is what a Christian man should look like. And we looked at that last week, or Christian lady should look like. But he began, if you recall, in verse 5, by telling them that it was going to take all diligence. In other words, it was going to take effort on their part. And uh, what we see here is that we go to the Word, just like he said earlier, we go to the Word, we find what the Word says, and we obey the Word, and we can obey the Word because God has granted to us uh, by His divine power through the Holy Spirit to be enabled to live in obedience to the Word. So the lost man, if you go back to um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says that the lost man cannot understand the things of God, therefore he can't be obedient to the Word of God. But just as Paul goes on and and identifies the spiritual man as the one who can discern and obey the word of God, Peter says that you and I, or his readers in particular, can also partake of that divine nature by knowing the word and applying the word with all diligence. And so he goes on and he gives those different, those eight virtues that begin with faith. Okay? Okay. 
And so that brings us basically where we are today, beginning in verse 12. And so we move from um, uh, 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 truth and Christian growth to uh, truth and I think we have the wrong, yeah, we have the, y'all have the wrong presentation up. Um, so, so we move from, from uh, truth and Christian growth to uh, truth and reliability or historical reliability. And that's what he's going to be uh, introducing today. So if you'll give us a second, a commercial break, very quickly, we're going to change, uh, change this and, and get to where we need to be. Number four, up one right there. So what we'll do while we're waiting for this to come up or waiting for my iPad to wake up here, we'll, uh, let's read beginning in verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, okay? Peter says, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. For we did not, we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Father, thank you for your word, and we pray that you will help us to understand it properly today so that we might rightly divide, rightly live uh, by the message you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's try this. Here we go. Let me skip forward here. So we're looking today at truth and historical reliability. This will take us through the remainder of the, of the chapter. And the first thing that Peter points us to is the essentiality of Scripture. And yes, essentiality is a word. I looked it up. It means the essential character of Scripture. And that's what Peter is directing our attention to here. He says, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. And so the first thing Peter wants to do in, is to remind them. And so Peter says that one of the main reasons he's writing this letter is to remind them of what they already have. Notice he says at the end of that verse, he wants to remind them of the truth which is present with you. Now he says some other things here too. He, he, if you read it in the Greek, it says, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, uh, you, but, but you already know them. Uh, and, and literally in the Greek it says knowing them, and you could put already at the end. So knowing them already. So he's reminding them of things that they were already firmly, he says, established in. And both of these are in the perfect tense. So these are, he's looking at these things. These are accomplished facts. So in other words, they know the truth. They're established firmly in the truth. But he wants to make sure that he reminds them of that. And that's what he's been doing from the beginning of the, the chapter. And so what is he talking about? He says that they have truth that is already present with him. What is he speaking of there? I believe that he is speaking of the, the scriptures that they already have. As Jewish people, of course, they would have the Old Testament. But as we go deeper into his letter to them, we find out that not only do they have the Old Testament, but they have 
his letter, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I'm, I'm writing to you a second time, right? The second time I'm writing to you in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. They, so they have his, his word. Uh, he tells them to fall back on the words of the prophets and of the apostles. Um, but later in uh, verse 15 of chapter 3, he says this. He says, regarding the patience of our Lord's salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of scriptures to their own destruction. So they had the Old Testament being Jews. Of course they had the Old Testament. But he also says they have his first letter that he had written to him. But apparently, they also had access to letters that Paul had written. And so, he's directing their attention to the Word of God, to the message, the truth, he says, that is already with them. So, they know it. Uh, they're established firmly in it. It means they're grounded in the truth. But he wants to remind them. He even goes further and says that beyond just reminding them... Um, he, he wants to make sure that even when he's gone, they remember. So basically what he's saying here, and this, a lesson for us to learn is that we all need to be reminded. Even the oldest, most mature Christian needs to be reminded again and again of what the Word says. And that's why we make the Word a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Because as we continue on in life, uh, through the darkness of this world, we need to be constantly reminded of what the Word of God says. Because you remember, regardless of what some teach, there's a battle going on within us, and the battle is between uh, our new man, uh, invigorated, in, uh, given life by the Holy Spirit, and the old sin nature that continually wants its way and wants to go back to its old habits. And that's a constant thing that we have to battle. And, and Peter, I think, understands it. But not only does he understand that, he's already informed them that false teachers are going to come. Actually, he hasn't warned them. He's going to warn them in the next chapter. But the false teachers are on their way. They were already on the scene, but apparently had not reached this group of believers. And he's warning them, preparing them, have your guard up, standing firm in the truth, in order not to fall away. And we all need that type of reminding all over and over again. It's very familiar to what Jude says in Jude chapter 3. If you remember, Jude 3, uh, Jude, excuse me, Jude and, and, and first, uh, Second Peter chapter 2 are very similar to one another. And Jude says this in his opening statements. He says, A beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation... I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. And so what, P, uh, excuse me, what Jude is talking about here is the Christian system of belief. It's, our, it's the Christian worldview that's been passed down, the Christian doctrine. And one of the ways that we can know that is from the context of the verse itself. He says, I originally wanted to write to you about salvation, about belief in Jesus Christ unto salvation. But instead, I find it necessary to write to you to earnestly contend for the faith, the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. And so those false uh, teachers that Jude writes about were on the scene. If you continue looking at Jude and Peter, they were on their way. And Jude is telling them, look, you need to hold fast, just as Peter's telling them here, being reminded of the truth that they are, have already been established in and that is actually present with them in order to prepare them for the battles ahead against false teachers. Very similar to what Jude is teaching here. But not only that, Peter goes on and he says in verses 13 and 14, he says, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Now, so Peter says that I'm writing to you to stir you up. Now, the word stir, stir up, uh, or that is uh, 
translated as stir you up is, is the Greek word that means to awaken someone or to arouse someone. And so Peter is saying, look, you're grounded in the truth. He's con- commending them basically for, for being grounded in that truth. But he says, look, I'm, I'm calling, I'm, I'm writing to you calling. He was on his iPhone uh, calling them. He's writing to them to stir them up, to arouse them, to, to, to be on their guard for these false teachers who were coming. And he, he identifies in verse 14 that he was near death or his death was imminent. And so the question arises, at least in my mind, is, is did he know? Was, was he already uh, being held captive? Was, was, uh, did, did the Lord Jesus actually appear to him and speak to him, telling him that he was near death? Or, or how, wh- what's going on here? Well, I think the, the simplest way to view this is by remembering that Peter was probably the oldest of the group, uh, of the tw- original 12 and probably by this time, he's getting up, he's in his 50s and, and uh, getting older. <laughs> I turned 50 in a few months. Don't I? Anyway, uh, but Jim's like way out there. Um, but he's probably pointing us back to what John wrote about in John 21, verses 18 and 19, where Jesus tells Peter that when you get older, uh, someone's going to lead you where you don't want to go. In other words, Jesus informed Peter just as to how he would pass from this earthly life. So it's very possible that Peter is referring to that and looking around, he's probably in Rome writing this. Nero hated Christians, uh, was doing unspeakable things to Christians probably by this time. And so he might be looking around saying, hey, my, my time's short, Okay. So it's not necessarily that, that the Lord Jesus had given him a, another uh, revelation, although that's uh, possible. But I think he's probably thinking back to what Jesus originally said and looking at the circumstances surrounding him. So again, this is, this is a man who loves these people and he is wanting to make sure that before he passes from this life, he has prepared them for what is to come. And that's exactly what he says in the next verse. He says, And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. So he's preparing them to stand on their own. So it's Peter's mindset and his love for these people to make sure that when he is gone, they are capable of continuing to stand firm in the truth. Now this is, again, if you look at Peter and what he's saying here and, and look at the life of Paul, you see a, a parallel going on here. These men, pastors at heart, love God's people, love the people to whom they're writing and whom they are, to whom they're ministering. And, and so it comes out in, in much of their writing. If you will turn back to Acts chapter 20, you see a very similar instance going on in the life of Paul. Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 25. What has happened here is Paul is on his way to Jerusalem, not knowing or or having been given prophecy by others that uh, his time, if he went to Jerusalem, he'd be bound and, and eventually die. And so... Paul calls the, uh, the um, uh, elders of Ephesus to him in Miletus. And he's, he is in the midst of, of speaking to them at this time. And in verse 25, he says this, And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. So he's convinced that he's, he's on his way to death. In verse 26, he says this, because because I know you'll never see me again, I want to just reiterate, I want to to remind you, as Peter is saying in his letter, therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. 
I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, some of you elders even, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. So it's a very similar tone uh, that Peter is taking uh, compared to what Paul was telling the uh, uh, elders of Ephesus. And so it reveals their, their pastor's heart, really, that they love these people. They want to make sure they're not going to be there anymore. It's kind of like a, a parent letting go of the child. You know, you're going to be on your own. So these are the things you need to remember. When, when things come up in your life, you need to remember these things. And that's what Peter's doing, reminding them of that. And we need the same type of reminder over and over again. Because we tend to forget and we tend to revert to our old ways of living if we're not careful. Well, Peter goes on and he points them to the reliability and supremacy of Scripture. Look at verse 16. Okay, so he's saying, I want to be diligent so that when I'm gone, you'll be able to call these things to mind. What things? The truth that is present with you, the Old Testament, the writings of the apostles, uh, the, uh, the, the gospels even. Now, he may not have been thinking about that specifically, but he's talking about uh, scripture here. And he goes on, four, and of course, four is, 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 is going to give us a reason. He's going to draw a reason here. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Let's just stop there for a second. So Peter first directs them to the fact that he and uh, uh, James and John were eyewitnesses to the transfiguration. I believe, uh, I, I believe that that is most likely uh, the instance that he is discussing here. The transfiguration. When he, Peter, James, and John were taken up on the mountain with Jesus and they saw him transfigured. And if you recall, just prior to that, Matthew chapter 17, 1 through 8 is, is the record of that. But just prior to that, at the end of chapter 16, Jesus said some of these here, uh, some of these will, be, uh, will, will not pass on to, the, to, the, to their heavenly reward, uh, paraphrasing of course, until they see me coming in glory. In other words, Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration witnessed the majesty and the display of power that belonged to Jesus Christ that will once again be displayed at his second coming. So in that instance, what we saw was a foreshadowing of that moment when Jesus returns to bring his kingdom to earth. And so Peter is pointing them back to that. He's saying, look, we're not following cleverly devised tales. The word, the word there is, is uh, the word that we get myth from. It's mythos. And it means a myth. And it referred to the Greek tales about their gods that weren't to be taken literally, but were to demonstrate some sort of spiritual or practical application for the lives of the Greeks. Peter said, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're not giving you myths or fables, something that, uh, and in particular here, uh, it would be used as a fable, something that was not true. So Peter's saying, look, when we are speaking to you, we're not speaking to you of something that is not true. Let me tell you about what happened. And so he points them back to that moment in time where they experienced the transfiguration, that majestic glory of Jesus Christ showing through that will once again come when he brings his kingdom. So he reminds him of that, but he goes on from there. And he, of course, explains the, uh, the, the, what exactly happened. So he gives them a testimony of what happened. He says, For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, in, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. All right. Now, we look at what Peter's saying here. These aren't myths. These aren't fables. This is a true thing that, I've, that we've been telling you. And why is he saying that? 
Is he trying to say that the false teachers are going to be teaching myths and fables? No, that's not what his point is. The, it's actually the other way around. The false teachers were saying that the, the apostles' teaching was myth. It was fable. It wasn't to be taken literally. Sound familiar? And so these false teachers are going around saying, look, that's not to be taken literally. As a matter of fact, we're going to get over to chapter 3 where he uh, uh, mentions the fact of what exactly is it that they're, that they're belittling of Scripture. And we find that they're belittling the creation and the end times. So creation and eschatology or creation and the second coming. They're, they ridicule that. Where is the promise of his coming? Because all things are just as they always have been. From the beginning of the world. And of course he corrects, uh, corrects he cre corrects, thank you, they're a, they're a false, uh, false teaching there. But anyway, and so what he does from here is that he points them to the supremacy of the written word of God. Look what he says in verse 19. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. I want to stop there for just a moment. The supremacy of the written word. Now, when you get to this passage in the Greek, it is extremely difficult uh, to decide the proper reading because it really lends itself to being read in two different ways, which is what makes it so difficult. First of all, uh, if you look at your copy of the word of God, you'll probably see the first word so is in italics and has a, a number by it or, or some sort of note directing you to somewhere else. Well, it's because the word so is not there. It begins with the, the Greek word chi, and, even, also. That's what the word usually means. And so how do we read that? And also, if you, if you keep going in the verse, you find the word made more sure. The word made is not in the Greek text. It's added. They're trying to, the, the, the uh, translators were trying to clarify uh, uh, and make it easier for us, us to understand what was being said here. But it's still confusing if you think about it. Fruchtenbaum, I think, did a great service by pointing out these two different possible readings here. The first possible reading is something along the lines of because they saw what they saw and heard the voice, and now I'm quoting, they are better certified than before concerning the prophetic word. In other words, they had the prophetic word, but they needed the, 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 the experience of seeing what they saw and hearing the voice from heaven to confirm uh, or, or help them better uh, have, have more faith in the written word. There's a problem with that reading. And I bet some of you probably already think of what it is. Who's the authority here? Is it the word of God or is it the experience? It's the experience. That reading really puts the experience above the authority of the word of God. So that we can't really trust the scripture unless we have something in our lives confirming it. Well, that, then who needs faith, right? The other reading, and both of the, we have to accept that both of these readings are possible from the Greek text. It's very difficult. At least it was difficult for me. The other reading, Fruchtenbaum says, the word of prophecy is a surer confirmation of God's truth than the voice that came from heaven. In other words, the Old Testament is more convincing than the voice, because it is always true that the written word is always more valid than one's own experience. So in this reading, it puts the written word above our experience. So here is a, 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 another literal rendering of what this verse says. He closes out, verse 18, We ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. We have or And we have the even more sure prophetic word. So you see what's going on, okay? I saw the experience. I was there. I experienced it. But we have the more sure prophetic word of the Old Testament scriptures. So Peter would, could, may possibly say something like this. 
that was an awesome experience that I had. But the word of God is what I rely upon. Because we have these false teachers coming in, Peter's warning about, who probably have all kinds of their own experiences to fall back upon. We saw in the Sunday school hour how people say, the Lord told me this or that. I experienced this or that. And they put their experience or their personal revelation above the sufficiency of Scripture. Well, not only that, however, Peter goes on from there in verse 20. Knowing this is what he literally says here. Knowing this first of all. And he says, first of all, when somebody says knowing this first of all, what do you think they're trying to do? They're explaining to you something that is, is, is a point that is necessary before moving on any further. He says, so before we go any further, you need to know this. No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, let's make sure we understand what he's saying here. Because it's, I think it's easily misunderstood. First of all, let's look at that word prophecy. Prophecy is the act of of, of interpreting the will of the gods. A prophet was one who would receive the message from a God and interpret it to the people, okay? So when we see Joel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all those gentlemen from the Old Testament, what they are doing is interpreting the message of Yahweh, the one true God, to the people of Israel. So he says that no prophecy... No utterance that comes from divine will or purpose is the matter of one's own interpretation. So he's not saying that some, some prophet comes along and receives a message from God and then has to somehow interpret it and give it to the people. Not that type of interpretation. What I'm doing is trying to interpret scripture and, and give you what I've found. That's not what the Old Testament prophets did. They simply received the message which needed no interpretation in this manner and delivered it to the people. So no word of prophecy required the prophet's personal interpretation. He simply relayed the message. That's what Peter's saying here, okay? Now, well, let me just keep on before I break my train of thought here. So the word interpretation here the Greek word also can mean explanation. So no, no prophetic utterance of the will of the divine authority, God the Father, required any prophet's explanation. All they had to do is pass it on. And he goes on, he says, because, or for, no prophecy was ever made. That's the, a that's the Greek word that is sometimes used of, of, uh, uh, of a of a pack animal carrying something on his back. It's, it's, it's a word that means to be, be brought into existence or to be produced. Um, so no prophecy was ever produced by an act of the human will, but men moved, the same word used again, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Now, the second time the word moved is used there, same word, but different nuance. In this instance, it's referring to uh, it, it's used sometimes uh, of a boat on the water being blown along by the wind. And so what he's saying here is that when the prophets of old spoke, they were not producing the prophecy. They were simply being borne along by the Holy Spirit like a ship on the water and producing the divine revelation from God the Father. So that's why Peter is telling them, look, I had an experience. It was a great experience. But we have the, the more sure prophetic message from God. And look at what he says in verse 19. Go back to verse 19. To which you do well to pay attention. I've had the experience but you will do well to pay attention to the word of God as, as if it were a lamp that shines in a dark place. We live in a dark world, a sin-darkened world, often used through Scripture. Until, 
The day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. The day. I believe Peter's directing our attention once again to the time when the Lord Jesus returns. The morning star was the a Greek expression referring to Venus that is most visible just before sunrise. And so he's pointing their minds to that moment when the Lord Jesus returns. And for the church, the morning star rising in our hearts could very well be a reference to the rapture of the church. Now, I'm just putting that out there. It's not in the context, but, it, but we're not waiting for the second coming. We're waiting for the, the Lord Jesus Christ to take his bride home. And so the question then, of course, is once we get to the end of this, so what? What does this mean for us? Well, I, I just quickly jotted down a few things uh, that came to my mind, and, and I know there's more. And if I think of something while we're going through this, I'll share it with you. But what can we glean from this passage? Well, first of all, you and I, just like his original audience, must constantly be reminded of the truth of God. That's why for the last couple of years, Meadow and I have put our heads together and, and, and actually I've said, hey, Meadow, can you do this? And she did it. So she's the brains of the operation anyway. And so she gets us this this. Bible reading plan that we've put out for the last couple of years so that we can each of us go through the word of God, the whole thing throughout the year. And that's a great thing to do because you get, that, you get that synthetic view of scripture. In other words, you get the whole overview by simply going through it quickly in a year, not stopping to, to, to plant yourself on one passage, but looking at the whole thing. But also above that, we need to sometimes stop, not sometimes, we need to very often stop and plant ourselves in, in a book or, uh, of, or of the Bible and just devour it like we're having a Sunday meal because the pastor went too long and I'm really hungry and I want to get out of here and go to, to you know, I know you high class people go to McDonald's, so um, you want to gorge on something. Well, just like Peter said, we need to long for the pure milk of the word and some, not, I keep saying sometimes, not sometimes, but all the time. Not only do we need to be going through an overview of Scripture, a synthetic reading, just Genesis to Revelation, but we also need to plant ourselves and dig deep and find what we can from Scripture in order to build those virtues in our lives that Peter speaks of earlier. And so we constantly need to be reminded. How many of you have something in your life you do you're going to do it today. When you leave this place, you're going to go, good night, I did it again. And then you have to confess it. Lord, I confess that attitude because that guy cut me off. Right? Why do we do that? Because we have to constantly be reminded. So when you remember that I should not have had that attitude, is that you or is that the Holy Spirit? I'm going to stick with what Peter said earlier. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it could be one, the other, or both. But if you think that way, it's because you have the knowledge of the Word of God that what you just did was wrong, and you remember, I need to confess that sin. And so the Spirit reminds us. Sometimes our own conscience reminds us when it's being constantly refreshed by the Word of God. We also See here that we need to constantly be encouraged to grow up in Christ. Especially men. Because we're perpetual kids sometimes. Donald. And, um, you know, we need to grow up in Christ, Donald. And, and be mature men. Donald. It's got a flower in it. And then finally, no, I've got one more. Um, we need to lean on the word of God, not our experiences. Our ex you know, I wish I had the depth of knowledge that some of the teachers that I list to uh, have that can actually explain. But you know, your, your senses are not reliable. My experience is not reliable. My emotions are not reliable. Now, we don't want to check our emotions at the door. Emotions are a gift from God. But those emotions have to be governed by the word of God, just like all of our actions do. 
just like all of our thought processes, need to be governed by the Word of God. And you can have an experience that is not from God. Saul, Old Testament King Saul, had an experience that was out of the will of God when he called up the prophet Samuel from the dead. Now, how all that worked out, I don't know. But apparently it was actually Samuel. It's not an experience I want to have. God was not pleased with it because he was in direct disobedience to what God had said. Don't do stuff like that. Well, finally, I'll just end with this. And you can probably dig through here and find some more things. But it is the word of God that guides us and enables us to stand against false teachers. Again, turning to, and it was just providential that it worked out the way it did this morning because I had two videos that we tried to watch that just, I'm going to have to call and complain to somebody about. But, so I had not planned on playing that third one. But I look at the church around us and, and, I, and I read on websites, I read on Facebook, and I read the things that people put on there that are just, I have no doubt that many of these people are just sincere, God-loving Christians. But they don't know what the Word of God teaches. And they're out here chasing all of these things that are, are very, they're, a lot of them are very spiritual. It's just that they're not from the right spirit. And yet they believe them. And if you try, and, and believe me, I have spent way too much time going back and forth with some of these people to where I just want to pull my hair out because no amount of scripture will convince them because they've experienced it or they read something from so-and-so who's really a godly person and, and it just made me have my warm fuzzy and I just refuse to give it up. Well, but Scripture says this. I don't care. This person said that. Yeah, but this is the authority. And so, if we're, and, and let me tell you, my friends, false teachers, you go to any Christian bookstore, Lifeway in particular, because that's the denomination I come out of, it, you have to really be on guard. Because nine, I, I, I would lay my life on this that 95 to 99% of what they have in there is bad. Because the people who run it are more concerned with the bottom line than being right with what Scripture teaches. Of course, now I must say this also, that if they only went with things that were in line with what Scripture teaches, they'd probably only have one shelf wouldn't be good for business. So we need to learn from what Peter teaches us to go to Scripture, to be prepared to face false teachers by being grounded in the Word of God and the truth that He has given to us, that truth, as he says, that truth that is present with you. Father, we thank you for your Word, and we pray that you would help us to lean on your truth and your truth alone to guide us each day. Help us, Father, to be able to accurately handle your word of truth so that we can combat false teaching and we can answer the questions that lost people have. Help us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, Father, as we leave this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.